AEW Full Gear 2023, man. What a show this was. I'm going to talk about every match on the show and the stories of the show. There was some stuff that was a bit of a letdown. There was some stuff that wasn't. There was The, the show was definitely... It might not be as good as Wrestle Dream. I don't think any one match on this show was as good as Brian Danielson versus Zack Sabre Jr. It just wasn't, but... My God, was there a lot of stuff, lots of variety. The show did not feel like it was bloated or going too long. And I'm just going to say this before we go into the details. MJF, bro, is an absolute master of the craft. MJF and Shane Strickland, in my opinion, MJF and Shane Strickland, right, tonight, like, they proved that these guys are... These are main event guys. Like, I think MJF is already an all-time great, and he's not even 30 yet. There's a very small number of guys who can who can say that ever in history. Because it takes time for most people to get that good. You know, lots of experience going around the world. MJF in his 20s is already there, man. What's What great storytelling this whole show had. So, I want to go over the Zero Hour stuff because it does tie into the main show. Eddie Kingston wrestled Jay Lethal for the Ring of Honor world title, and he won the match. It was about a 10-minute match, a pretty basic opener, nothing bad about it. It was a fun little match. There's not much else I can say about that. Claudio Castagnoli versus Buddy Matthews. This is the match I wanted to see on Collision, and it is kind of a TV match. Uh, Claudio won. Obviously, they're going for... Well, at least I would assume they're going to do the Blackpool Combat Club against the um, the House of Black, and that is going to be a fun feud. Obviously, I lean more towards Brian, Claudio, and Moxley. Wheeler Yuta to me is still Wheeler useless. I'm sorry, I don't like the guy. He's not on the other guy's level. But if it's those three guys against the House of Black, those could be some phenomenal trios matches and singles matches and tag matches. It could be great. It could be great. Tony Khan's got a tremendous roster, and he added to it tonight. We'll talk about that in a minute. MJF and Samoa Joe versus the Guns for the ROH World Tag Team titles. Now, Joe, it was revealed it was going to be Joe, I think on Collision. They should have probably waited for this show. But what wound up happening was um, Joe agreed to be MJF's partner, and they did win the match, and it was fun. I mean, I actually really liked this match. Um, and, and I had already heard a couple weeks ago, I think, give or take, that they were going to have Joe versus MJF main event the at World End pay-per-view, the final show of the year in December. So they had to already get this in for that. So, um, but they did not do the thing where Joe like turned on MJF. They didn't do that here. Instead, what happened was Joe left and he says, you know, you owe me, and he leaves. MJF is celebrating. The guns attack MJF, and they pilmanize him. So I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, what are they doing? Are they building up a story where MJF is going to be, uh, you know, is he going to be out or, or hurt during the main event, has to fight back? Is he going to be that valiant, triumphant baby face? Is that what he's going to be? That's exactly what they did. But before then, they gave us a bit of a swerve where it looked like MJF was going to the hospital. And he did go to the hospital. He was ambulanced out. Adam Cole was there. During the pay-per-view, they revealed that Adam Cole, even though he's still injured on crutches, is replacing MJF for the world title. So this felt like a bait and switch. Really what it was is it was a double subversion because it wound up not being that. Now, I've been critical of Tony Khan's booking in the past, and obviously AEW's got a bunch of problems, but once again, this is the kind of wrestling I like. I like surprises. I like swerves, if they make sense. I like subversions, twists and turns. I like storytelling and drama, and this entire MJF story had it. If we go to the main event, Adam Cole and Jay White are in the ring. And then before the match starts, MJF's the ambulance. They cut to the back and there's an ambulance that shows up. And it's MJF driving it. This is literally stolen. They literally stole this from the 1999 Royal Rumble. Remember what happened in the Royal Rumble in 99? 
It was Austin and Vince McMahon were number one, number two. The corporation laid out Austin. He went to the hospital. And then during the Rumble match, he ends up hijacking the ambulance and driving himself back to the arena. It was the same exact thing they did in 1999. It wasn't as cool, but it was still cool. MJF then goes on to wrestle Jay White. And let me tell you this right now. I'm going to talk about the main event first, and we're going to get to the rest of the show. Listen, look. This is not, if you're expecting this match to be like those classic AEW main events with lots of uh, near falls, I mean, it did have that, but if you're expecting this to be like a New Japan style Tokyo Dome main event with crazy moves, that's not really what we got here. What we got here was tremendous storytelling and selling from MJF. MJF sold the leg the entire match. He did not waver. MJF was you know, wrestling in there, struggling, trying to defeat this man, having a hard time doing it. At one point, the guns get ejected from the building and Cole's out there. And of course, they kind of do the teases of, you know, is Cole going to turn on MJF? Bunch of near falls. They have a spot where uh, MJF gets clocked with the AEW world title that Cole was holding. Jay White took it from him and hit him with it. It was only a two count. Um, and so, and that was a good near fall. But, but the thing about this match is... It's the storytelling. Like, if you're worried about, like, if your kind of wrestling is not this, it's not for you. This is the best kind of wrestling for me. This is a fantastic main event. Sell, MJF sold his ass off. Great storytelling. Great moves. No, it wasn't like a Jay White Okada match where it's just balls to the wall extreme. But it didn't need to be. They didn't have to do too much. They actually did a lot. There was a spot with this table the, the announce table that broke before MJF could do the move, but he still went off the top rope and elbow dropped Jay White on the outside, and there was no table. So nothing broke his fall but the floor. This dude is nuts, bro. This dude is freaking nuts. But once again, what a great story. This told a story, and that is the most important thing. Storytelling. This, this, is, this match had drama. And so the finish, you know, they basically traded near falls for a while, you know, and what ended up happening was uh, Cole put the dynamite diamond ring on the apron, told MJF to grab, but Jay White got it. He went to go use it, but MJF hit him with a low blow. The referee didn't see it. MJF gets the ring. The guns come out, but they get nailed. Then Jay White gets nailed, and then MJF, and then, like, they kind of, he hit him, but they kind of made it seem like Jay White would kick out. But no, it was a one, two, three. Adam Cole and MJF hugged, and that's how the show ended. I'm going to go down and talk about the rest of the show in a minute. But tremendous, tremendous storytelling. MJF and Adam Cole's story going back to the summer into All In and past it is the best thing AEW has ever done, in my opinion. This, to me, beats the the, the storyline with Kenny Omega and um, and Adam Page. Beats it completely. To me, this is better than the Jericho John Moxley thing from 2019-2020. This is the best story they've ever done, in my opinion. AEW, even though they're not drawing TV ratings, they're not drawing big crowds, the stories are the best they've ever been so far, in my opinion. So, the show actually opened with the trio of Adam Copeland, Sting, and Darby Allen all wearing face paint with Ric Flair in their corner against the Patriarchy, which is Christian, Luchasaurus, and Nick Wayne. Lots of action. Um, I'm glad they put this on early. They didn't, like, you know, overdo it. Uh, the Christian Christian and Edge, I mean, that's, that's really what they are. That feud is, you know, I like that it's going slow. So... I'm not going to talk about the Ric Flair thing because I already did a video about it on the channel with Medios. Um, that's, hey, it's already been talked about. But and I have no problem with Ric Flair being there necessarily, even though I understand people who have. I get it. The one thing I want to talk about, though, is Darby Allen. This dude, listen, man. Darby Allen does. So Sting is doing stuff that no 62 year old man should do. Darby Allen's doing stuff that nobody should do at any age. I mean, this man wants to climb Mount Everest, and I don't know how he's going to do that, but this guy could be dead trying to climb the mountain, bro. Like, this guy, he has a death wish. He takes these bumps that are unsafe. 
You know, he, he gets his body thrown around like, oh, I don't know, man. I He's going to end up feeling it when he gets older. So then they followed this up with Orange Cassidy versus John Moxley for the international title. Now, I've been critical of Tony Khan and how he books the pay-per-views as far as what matches, like the match order. I think this show had perfect match order. I love the way they did it. I love the way the matches went. I love the order. This show and Double or Nothing earlier this year, I think had the best match order. I don't think All In had it. I don't think All Out had it uh, or even Wrestle Dream. Because if it, it, you know, I know that Wrestle Dream was Edge's debut, but obviously, it went on too long. Obviously, this show though felt better. But anyways, I I have been very critical of Orange Cassidy. I don't like his TV matches. I know that ev- almost everybody does. I I don't like the character with the pockets, but he has been kind of leaving that character a little bit. John Moxley, of course, he bled, and that's the thing. I don't like these two guys because they are one-trick ponies. All their matches are the same, in my opinion, especially Mox. However, however, hear me out. This was great. This was great. They told a great story. I love the finish that Orange Cassidy basically pulled a Roman Reigns with the Superman punch, but it's the Orange punch. Just kept hitting him, kept hitting him, kept hitting him. Hit him with like five. And Mox went down, and so Orange Cassidy retains, getting his win back from the all-out pay-per-view. One of the biggest wins, if not the biggest, in Orange's career. Um, Like I said before, I have no problem with Orange Cassidy as a person. I don't like the gimmick. However, he is slowly dropping the pockets thing and becoming more of a serious wrestler. Still keeping some of the comedy, but it was great. And they kind of teased that they were going to do like a, a... uh, and I don't know if they're going to do it, but they almost teased dissension between him and Hook. So that could be a match they do at some point, but I really like this match. And it didn't even go that long. 12 minutes, it felt fine. I liked it. Tony Storm against Hikaru Shida. Uh, I liked the match. I feel like it, it felt like a TV match, but I did like it. It wasn't, it was one of the weaker matches on the show. Now, what wound up happening is Tony Storm won the title back. Now, I know some folks are going to say, oh, you know, uh, the title is a hot potato. And you know what? Sheeta has had short reigns. And I get people not liking that. But Tony Storm is, like, right now having the most interesting character in the women's division with the whole black and white 1920s stuff. I love that stuff. So... She should be the AEW World's Champion, uh, Women's Champion, and she should be feuding with a number of baby faces as time goes on. So uh, they're they're kind of booking it like that. And I, and again, I know that Sheeta just won it like last month, and it is being hot potatoed. But I don't know. I have no problem with it. I really don't. Mariah May was there. That's gonna be like the stalker storyline they did with Trish Stratus and uh, Mickey James. Just a newer version of it, probably with less lesbian stuff in it. So I enjoyed it. Then we had an interesting match. They had a four way ladder match for the AEW tag titles. Ricky Starks and Big Bill, who are the champions, against FTR, whom they beat for the titles. The Kings of the Black Throne, they're calling themselves, which is Malachi Black and Brody King. And then La Facción Ingobernable, which is Rouge and Drillistico. Um, I actually was looking, well, I I know this is going to sound weird, man, this wasn't that good. There were parts of this match that were good. Like, there were moments that I thought were crazy, there were crazy spots, but I don't know. I couldn't get into it as much as I wanted to. I don't know why that is. Maybe it was, maybe it's me. Maybe I was distracted. You know, there was some stuff going on, so I will admit to you that maybe I have to go back and watch it again. I just didn't get that into it. I had other people say it was a phenomenal ladder match, um, and I was excited for it going into the pay-per-view. It just did not connect with me. It didn't connect. But I do like that it's a four-way with different teams. Like, these are teams that you don't normally see except for FTR. It wasn't the Young Bucks. It wasn't the Lucha Bros. It wasn't like any of those teams, the Acclaimed. It were the best friends. It was actually different teams. And it does show the depth of the AEW tag team division. We need new guys getting title shots. And we're going to get to that more later when we get to the the Elite and Jericho match. But yeah, this to me was... It was fine. I should probably go back and watch it again. You know, nothing on this show was really that offensive. 
So then we had the TBS title, Chris Statlander versus Sky Blue versus Julia Hart. The first half of the match, this match started off slow. It's hard to get into. You know, I, I like all three of these women. Like, they're all fine, uh, both physically as well as in the ring. Sky Blue's booty is, you know, untouchable. And actually, I forgot to mention, Tony Storm beat Hikaru Shida with her big ass. She literally put, like, a piece of metal in her ass and then did the Rikishi, you know, ass in the corner spot. I should have mentioned that earlier. And it's funny because I know that I might be late to the party, but Tony Storm has a giant fucking ass, bro. She has a huge ass, and I didn't even notice it till like, this past week on Dynamite. Or maybe it was Collision last week. I was like, holy shit, she has a big ass. Like, her ass, her booty is big, bro. And I didn't really, it didn't really hit me until recently. But it was good. It was, it's big. Anyways, back to this match. Julie Hart, Julia Hart winning... I don't know how I feel about that. I kind of wish that Statlander had a longer reign. I, I don't think this has been the best title reign for Chris Statlander, but it's not her fault. The problem with AEW right now, guys, and I've said this before, there's too many fucking belts and too many champions. There's too many titles. When you have the Ring of Honor titles also being defended in AEW, when you have titles from Mexico and Japan being defended from time to time, it dilutes the championships. The belts don't mean anything. They don't draw. You could say, oh, this week on Dynamite, we're going to have so-and-so versus so-and-so for the titles, and most fans are not going to care. There's too many titles. They really need to scale back all the titles because there's too many. You don't have to have a TNT title and an international title. You don't. You just don't. And I should also mention, you know, on the pre-show, I forgot if I talked, did I talk about Christian in the pre-show? I don't know if I did. Did I talk about it? I don't even remember. Well, anyways, Christian... Wait, no, I'm thinking of... No, I'm sorry, not the pre-show. I'm, I'm an idiot. I'm thinking of Rampage last night. Yeah, Christian wrestled, uh, I think, Trent Barretta, and they had a good match. But again, too many belts. Uh, that's just an issue they've got going on, and it is what it is. So then they revealed that the signee was going to be Will Ospreay. And that's interesting because he said he didn't want to sign with an American company. He, couldn't, he didn't want to live in America. But he's going to have some... He's going to finish off his New Japan Pro Wrestling stuff first. And I think the story is that he's going to... He's coming in, and that's good. Like, Will Ospreay's one of the two, maybe three best in the entire world. I've been on Will Ospreay's dick forever. It's a good signing for AEW. I think they have too much talent, really. Like, way too much, but it's Will Ospreay. I don't blame Tony Khan for signing him. I would have, too. Um, and so, but it's still a thing where it's like, you know, you got a lot of guys, man, and they're all good. Like, it's hard to have bad pay-per-views when you have this much talent. And I believe, from what I understand, he's still going to be living in the UK and just come to America. So he'll, he'll be kind of a part-timer. But that's okay because his style fits more for part-time because his matches are crazy. Swerve Strickland and Hangman Adam Page. Texas death match. This was the match of the night. This was the match of the night and one of the best matches of the year. One of the most violent matches in AEW history. I don't know what else to tell you, but there was some disgusting stuff in this match, yo. You had barbed wire. You had tacks. You had staple guns to the face, staple guns to the chest. You had duct tape stuff. You had barbed wire boards. I mean, this was this was maybe a tribute to the Kenny Omega, John Moxley match they had a few years ago at Full Gear. Obviously not with the rat traps, but you know. It was like that. It was like that. And my God, I've said this before. I said it during Wrestle Dream. If you fail to understand the greatness of Swerve Strickland, this is a legitimate main eventer. If you don't think so, you're an absolute fool. He's had main event charisma, main event energy for years. And now we are seeing it. And this was such a good freaking feud and guess what adam page put him over one two three in the middle bro well not one two three it was it wasn't that it was a 
last man standing Texas death match, so it was a 10 count. But it ended when he wrapped a chain around Hangman and hung Hangman. He literally hung him, yo. That, the fact that Hangman got hung is just crazy. Just completely nuts. Come just so good. So, 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 so good. This was the match of the night. This in the main event. Uh, this had better get a lot of stars from Meltzer, bro, because it was crazy. I think I may have still liked the Swerve Strickland page match from last month. It was more technical. But, man, this was good. And and they really, again, two straight wins over Adam Page. Swerve is a main eventer. That's the guy to beat MGF for the title in 2024. Not now, in 2024. So then we had the Golden Jets, Kenny Omega, Chris Jericho versus the Young Bucks. Okay, the booking of this was weird. I, okay, the, the, the this was weird, okay? The the Elite imploding again, it's too soon to see that again. The build-up to this match I thought was weak. Having the Young Bucks be behave like petty bitches is so different considering they just went babyface again like, you know, last year. I don't like this. I don't like the direction. I'm still interested, but I don't like this. This was like, you know, I think this show should have had Kenny Omega against, like the match they had on Dynamite with Kenny, Coda, and Jericho against the the the, the clan of, uh, of, of Don Callis, that should have been on this show. I don't know what it is, but the Young Bucks kind of need to take some time off, I feel. There's, they haven't been in any interesting storylines since the feud with the Blackpool Combat Club earlier this year. And I still feel like this, this was missing something. The match was not bad. It got fun near the end. The last half of the match was really good. Kenny Omega teased at one point turning on Jericho and hitting him with the V-trigger. But he actually hit you know one of the Bucks. I forget which one. Crazy near falls here. They actually, there was a moment where I think Nick Jackson hit the um hit the one winged angel on Kenny. Like this was this the last like 15 minutes, yo. I think it was Nick, yeah. Balls to the wall, dude. Balls to the wall. It started off slow, but balls to the wall. They were hitting each other's finishers. But the thing is, the Young Bucks, their style is not for everyone. And Jericho kind of had a hard time following it because this match had a lot of that super choreographed lucha stuff. If you're into that stuff, you'll like it. I personally feel like I do like the Young Bucks style. I used to hate it, but it grew on me. However, I do feel like this... They need a vacation. I think they need time off. There's nothing that interesting going on with them. And actually, now that Kenny won, because Kenny won with the uh, one wigged Angel uh, on Matt... And then both of them threw a fit at ringside. They threw away their clothes. They were ripping off like tape. They were just really pissed off, throwing temper tantrums like bitches. So if the Young Bucks are going to end up being now whiny heels, I don't know, man. Like I, I don't like that direction for them. I'd rather they take time off because it's just not... They should take time off. This is their home city, L.A., you know, near Reseda. But I think now is the time for them to kind of go away for a bit, maybe six months, and let Jericho and Kenny be a team. Maybe come back and beat them for the tag titles if Jericho and Kenny can beat Ricky Starks and Big Bill. You know what I mean? That, that to me, might be better. There was something missing here, and I don't like the story that much. So I already talked about the MJF-Jay uh, White match earlier in this video, so we're going to wrap it up, but I want to say... Uh, very, very, very good pay-per-view. AEW pay-per-views are always very good. The booking, once again, I think has improved tremendously. I like WWE's booking as well. Right now, both companies are doing very, very well. And man, Strickland and MJF, man, these dudes need to be... These dudes need to be... They really need to be understood and appreciated. They were so good. Anyways, let's see what happens. That's it. Take care, and I'll catch you next time.